Hello, I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Todd Deshida. And this is the inaugural episode of Climate Optimus. In this podcast, we'll be focused on solving climate change by creating shared awareness of what needs to be done, why we think it's possible, and how each of us can play a role. So who are we? Well, I was born in 1940. No. <laughs> We're just a couple of uh, basically country kids that moved to the city. About half kind and of. half. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, yeah. I feel like, I That's feel a like hard we question both... to answer in some ways. I know. Well, I think it's, both, it's fair to say we both grew up in a rural area, spent our life around farming, ranching, in my case, forestry. We're accustomed to that. And then we also, I don't know about you, but I feel like being in that natural resource-based industries, you see changes on the land. Correct. Yeah. And then we went to college and you went to fancy college. (laughs) I mean, it wasn't that fancy. It's pretty fancy. That's fair. And then you needed a job. Yeah. I ended up working on your family farm for the summer after I graduated. Do you think at this point, my dad feels like he got a good return on investment? No. (laughs) But that's when we all. met each other, right? I mean, that was... Yep. And then we came out to, you know, big Portland, Oregon. We've been here ever since. So, I guess maybe we'll start with kind of like, why are we doing this? Because I think that's important. You know, I think the reason I wanted to do this was I have, you know, concern about climate change, of course, like a lot of people do. And it's hard to know what to do about it. And it's hard to know what's going on. It's so big. Such a big problem. Yep. And I thought, gosh, this will be a way to learn a lot about what's going on, you know, because you kind of force yourself to learn this stuff to to be able to talk about it and talk to other people about it. And the other reason was that I feel like it's easy to feel like an imposter when you're talking about these things and because we're all compromised, right, in so many ways. And I go, I'm thinking there's got to be a ton of people out there that feel exactly that same way. And For sure. I don't want people to feel that way because, like I said, everybody's compromised and we all have things that we got to work on and we all have to figure out a way to come together to, to fix this thing. And so all these little things that you think, you know, I don't do this and I'm, I'm not the most like this. And, you know, aside from all of us just like living in a tent on Mount Hood or something – you know, just just functioning in American life is going to be hard to not have impact, right? So totally, we kind of have to get over that. You kind of have to get over that hump of feeling like you're an imposter, you know? Yeah. And just kind of trudge forward and do this thing and realize that it's just going to take regular people, you know, like myself, that are going to be able to to fix it. So that that's one of the reasons. That's that's the reason for me. I I don't know how I. I follow that. That was really eloquent. <laughs> I, I mean, similarly, I have this sense of, this sense of guilt. And to your point, I mean, it's really difficult in this day and age to have no impact. I think you know, while I certainly know a fair amount about climate change, and you know, spent a lot of career in the, you know, the energy sector. Um, there's a lot I don't know too, and I think this is an opportunity to learn along with folks. But I, I think more importantly is that I think there are reasons to be optimistic and that easily gets lost today. There's, there's so many things to talk about the doom and gloom. And while certainly climate change is, is a crisis and it's something we need to address. If we don't focus on the reasons to be hopeful, we're not going to get anything done. So for me, this is an opportunity to share I think the the reasons I see for hope and tangible ways we can make a difference. And I feel like I owe it to my, you know, my niece and nephew who who have no idea what's going on, nor should they at this stage, to make a difference. So Right. I have I I guess I in that in that same vein I have a, a child. Right. But he's on his own. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought we'd start things off with maybe covering some climate news headlines. And given our topic of the week, uh, which will be electric vehicles, we thought we would start with talking about kind of what's going on in the political sphere. So the Biden administration, as folks are probably aware, has put forth 
an infrastructure plan. And within that bold plan, there is about 174 billion that's earmarked more or less for helping boost our transition to electric vehicles. A hundred billion of that is set aside to fund rebates on new EVs, which is pretty fantastic. That would be sweet. Right. And then there's another 15 billion that he has earmarked for charging infrastructure. So just to jump in here, I see that basically the Republican offer are, I suppose, what are they calling themselves now? It's like a joint, the bipartisan group of senators. Right. It's basically the Republican counter offer, I think, is $15 billion. Not not just for the electric charging, but $15 billion for the whole thing. Which is sad. I mean, that's well, just... Well, it's a joke. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> it, you know, we're talking about this crisis and, you know, Biden's put for something that's pretty meaningful at 174 and right. you know having that get cut down i guess the path now to get those dollars back in is i think as part of the reconciliation process that the democrats are going to try to package up some of the other things that they wanted to pass as part of that original infrastructure plan ah but you know weren't able to with trying to get it through in a bipartisan fashion so there's a $3.5 trillion blueprint, and I think that's where they're envisioning that those dollars can make their way through. And regardless of how we do it, we need to get it passed because the clock is ticking. Yeah, this is it. I mean, there is no... How long would it be before they do another one of these? They'd have to wait another year, and who knows where we're going to be sitting. Right. Yeah, that's too long. Too long, for sure. The other piece is on on the congressional side, there are a number of bills Democrats are pushing forward to either extend and or expand the federal tax credit for electric vehicles, which is currently $7,500. Nice. Right now, there is a cap of 200,000 vehicles per manufacturer. So if you sell 200,000 electric vehicles as a manufacturer, your cars no longer qualify. So the goal of the Democrats, I think, is to remove that cap. And then in some proposals, they're actually talking about increasing the size of the tax credit. So adding 2,500 for cars that are made in the U.S., which would be great. And then another 2,500 on top of that for cars that are made with union labor as a, as a nod to, you know, union folks. Nice. Yeah. I noticed that the UAW was, they have, you know, some demands or the, the stuff obviously stuff they want to have happen about this tax credit thing they're obviously trying to push cars made by their folks and th- i mean that's understandable yeah so that's that's kind of what's going on at a federal level um, cool is there any proposal that is better or anything that is has struck you as being the, the one that yeah that's what we should do I, you know i think the tax credit is great yeah yeah the the challenge with the tax credit is you have to have tax appetite, right? You have to actually have made a fair amount of money to have that much you owe in taxes. So in a way, it really is for sort of the middle class and up. Right. The beauty of what the Biden administration is proposing is a rebate would be for everybody. And rather than having to wait until you file your taxes, you would get that. I think they're intending to have it be right when you purchase the vehicle. That would be ideal. So I wanted to spend this episode really talking about EVs, diving in a little bit deeper and, you know, not only talking about their benefits, but really talking about what role they can play in helping us reduce emissions. And before we get started there, just quickly, you know, figure we'd call it the fact that we both have EVs. Yes, we do. What do you, what do you like about your EV? It may be one of the most favorite cars I've ever owned, if not my favorite car. It's just, um... It's so easy. It's nice not having to go to the gas station <laughs> right. ever. It's, oh, and tell folks uh, it's a Chevy Spark, it's a, right? Yeah, I have a Chevy Spark, which was kind of pre the Bolt, which might more people might be familiar with the Bolt. Right. And it has the, the lower range of, of, I think it was advertised at like 80 miles or something like that, which doesn't sound like a lot. But, you know, when you do a lot of just city driving, 
it you know we probably use it for 90 percent or 80 percent of what the, the driving we do around here you know it's it's fun to drive too it's fast you know like they're quick <laughs> they have right. a lot of torque and they're it's a great car to drive around the city and it's quiet and easy and yeah i really i've really enjoyed it a lot i was just thinking i probably got to take that thing in Maybe for a maintenance check. There's just not, you know, there's nothing that goes on with them, so you don't. We don't drive a lot, so. Right. But I like. I should probably take it in though. There's got to be something. To there's look got to be some fluids, you know, brake fluid and other things to look at. I'm sure. What yeah. about you? What, what? I mean, yeah, mostly the same reasons. Uh, I, I think it's it's nice to be able to just plug in at home and. Right. You're able to go where you need to go. And you have the Tesla Model 3. Model 3. Yeah, and it's had plenty of range. I mean, in my case, there hasn't been a, you know, a place that I haven't been able to go, which has been pretty fantastic. So I guess we're not totally unbiased on this topic. I think it's clear we're both proponents. But I think it's <laughs> worth talking about transportation you know, kind of in the big picture. And folks may not know, but transportation is now the leading source of emissions in the U.S., 28 percent according to epa data and of those emissions that 28 percent about 60 percent of those are the cars that we actually drive so that's a big chunk that is a huge chunk if you yeah if you were to tackle some of that you know if you start thinking about the pieces of the pie that you could get at that would be a big one right and people are going to be buying cars no matter what totally you know so it's like if it's something that you can easily get done without a lot of work, it's just buying this car instead of that car, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> we'll talk about that more, but I, <laughs> yeah, I think that's the beauty of it in a way, right? You you and I as consumers, we all as consumers, this is something that's actually in our control. Yeah, it's hard for us to go buy a light rail system. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, yeah. Unless you're, you know, Jeff Bezos. Yeah, right. So given those emissions, if we talk about global warming, we're really, you know, we're talking about the need to limit emissions to ensure that we can keep warming within that 1.5 degrees Celsius that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says is really important to avoid kind of catastrophic impacts. And when they've done their modeling in order to, you know, meet that, beneath that rather, that 1.5 degrees Celsius, that we need to cut our emissions by about 45 percent by 2030 or more (laughs) and then that we need to get to a point where we're you know net zero really by 2050 which is not that far out heck no uh so in my mind we talk about the impact you know transportation has on emissions the fact that it's in our control to me it's a huge opportunity for us to be able to have a meaningful impact on getting to those targets yeah, that's that's intense. I mean, I hope. I mean, we we've got to give it the best shot, right? I mean, that seems like lofty goals, but you know, I'm surprised though. If you look at, I've been really surprised, really, with some of the U.S. automakers and how much it seems like they've really kind of just said, "Well, we're going to jump on this electric car thing." It, it really kind of took me by surprise, but they really seem to have have really embraced that. Yeah, I mean, they certainly have been quick about it, but but yeah. to your point, they've now come to the table and, you know, Chevy said they're going to be producing only electric vehicles by, I think it's 2035, and, you it's know... It's just crazy to think about. Yeah, it's huge, and that's not that far away. No. So, as we're talking about EVs, we should probably cover, you know, some of the things that, if you're not an EV driver, are sort of typical points of concern, one of which being, you know, the range of a vehicle. And where we stand today compared to like, you know, when your Spark first came out, most of the EVs on the market today offer you somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 200 to 250 miles range, which turns out is really plenty in terms of getting from point A to point B. If you're somebody who wants to have extra reserves, you can go, you know, 300 miles if you purchase the extra battery range for like a Tesla. I think Ford's Mustang Mach-E, they offer a 300 mile option with that as well. I think that Lightning... That their new F-150 Lightning pickup is somewhere around there, too. 
I think I think most of the manufacturers, my guess is, will include an option at some point where they're sort of yeah. their standard battery, which maybe falls in that two hundred mile, two hundred fifty mile range, and then a and then an add on. What I found interesting is I was kind of looking into this more, and to your point about being able to do eighty to ninety percent of your trips with your Spark, is the average American only drives twenty six miles a day, which isn't a lot. It's not a lot, and if you have a two hundred mile range, you're you're, you're going to be doing pretty good. You are, and and I think because the charging infrastructure is really getting there, you don't have to worry about that. You know, I'm going to get stalled somewhere. I mean, it requires a little planning because you have to know where your EV charging stations are. But it's not like there aren't ways to you know plan your trip to you know have the opportunity to top off if you need to. For sure, I'll I'll tell you another thing too about about charging and, and range. Before we bought that car, we we actually leased that car for a few years, cheap, right? Like 111 bucks a month or something like a cell phone <laughs> bill. And uh, I was worried that I was going to have to install a high voltage charger out here. And of course, it, it just comes with a regular charger. You just plug into an outlet, you know. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to plug that. We've never done it. I, I, I've never quick charged that car. Wow. I've only just, we you know, you drive it, bring it home, plug it in overnight, and that's it. And so it does all the charging at night for the most part, which is better for the grid and stuff too, right? In some ways, like power grid is pretty low demand at night. And that's when it charges anyway. Of course, when you get some of these longer range cars, though, you know, that quick charge might be a, a benefit, though, because you're actually going to be able to probably take some of those cars longer distances too where you might utilize right. you know a quick charge feature a little bit more than that car would but uh yeah so it hasn't it hasn't been a problem to charge yeah that's a good point i mean i have a i have a 220 charger installed at my house but the same thing i just plug it in at night yeah and i think the only times i've had to stop and and do a supercharge have been on longer road trips right and generally that's where you're going, you know, somewhere close to the car's range and you're just wanting to make sure you've got enough to get there. Sure. And just to index for people, you know, there are there are three types of chargers. There's level one, which is basically typical household voltage 110. There's level two, which is like 220 volt chargers. And there are more specifics around these than I'm than I'm uh, glossing over. But but in essence, you've got 110 220 volts and then uh, what they call supercharging uh, which is the higher voltage DC chargers where you hear about you know people can pull in and you know within 20 to 30 minutes um, have enough to be on your way that's pretty impressive though it is impressive you could eat lunch or something yeah I mean on your way it really it really turns into just kind of like a long stop at the gas station if you will right and and most of the time you're not having to make that stop because you're not traveling those those distances. In case folks are interested, there are I mean there are a number of places where you can get data regarding charging locations, but PlugShare and ChargeHub have both have nice interactive maps where you can look up the type of charger, you know, be able to confirm compatibility with your car, etc. And almost all the manufacturers now with their new vehicles are you know, including at least an app that you'd have on your phone. And, you know, when you're able to plug in your route like you would, then it's helping you figure out where you need to stop. So it it takes a lot of that thinking out of it and helps you feel, you know, comfortable that you're going to be able to get from A to B. That's sweet. Pretty soon they'll just drive you there too. That'll be nice. <laughs> That's fair. I, hope. I mean, it sounds like with your Spark, you've you've been able to get everywhere you need to go. And it's rated at 80 miles. It is. I will say, you know, when we first got it, I don't know if it was fully charged up when we left the dealer with it. And we came home, I think it was in the winter time too, if I remember right. Yeah, it was in December. And I think Chelsea and I came over to your place. And, you know, we didn't realize, this is probably true of gas cars too. The way you, obviously the way you drive. Right. And in these electric cars, the accessories you use is going to impact that a little bit. And of course, in those larger range cars, it's probably not going to matter as much, you know. And, right. But in this, it can, right? And so we drove over to your house, and I can't remember if we had. I'm like, oh, it's only what eight nine miles to Jason's house. We've got, we got twenty miles on here. 
it's not going to be a problem. And then, you know, we were kind of thinking about it on the way back, and you kind of see, like, if it's colder, you know, things, it, it, they're less efficient. So we were like, and now we think about that, and we're like, man, we were really cutting it close to <laughs> probably right. being on the side of the road somewhere. But uh, it's never, yeah, we've never been stranded in it by any means. So it's been nice. Yeah, I think you, when you start driving an EV, you just pay more attention to that kind of stuff because it isn't like you can just grab the gas can out of the back and walk to the For sure. And there's all these, there's all these displays and stuff in these cars that show you how much power you're using. And, you know, you go up a hill and you really see, you really see how much power it takes to climb a hill. Right. Of course, anybody who's ever ridden a bicycle will know how much power it takes to climb a hill. But you were just sucking that much gas down too. Yes. You know, when you were running your gas car, you were just, you were getting like, you know, three miles to the gallon when you were climbing the hill. You totally. just didn't know it. Well, let's talk a little bit about, about cost of EVs. So we mentioned the, the $7,500 tax credit and you can check out our website for links to be able to find out, you know, which models qualify. Sure. Um, and the reality is multiple models with the tax credit you're you're looking at about you know thirty three thousand range for a two hundred plus mile EV, that's not cheap but not expensive in today's dollars. No, that's pretty decent. And from what you were saying earlier with the two with the two hundred k is it two hundred k cap? Yeah. So the car I have and the car you have aren't eligible right anymore. Yeah, Tesla and General Motors because they kind of they were the innovators in a way they're now being punished because because yeah, they sold a bunch of cars exactly. That's uh, so weak. It really is. I mean, which gets back at <laughs> gets back at why it's important to be able to extend this credit. Although it's worth calling out that the Chevy Bolt, which is you know Chevrolet's kind of uh, flagship EV right now, even without incentives, it starts at thirty six thousand. That's not bad. Yeah, and and if you're lucky enough to live in a state that also has incentives, you can take some off the sticker price there as well. Nice. Like in Oregon, we have a you know twenty five hundred dollar rebate. You know, like the state of New Jersey has a five thousand dollar rebate. So you got to check kind of depending on where you live. But in addition to that federal credit, there's also state credits. Well, you know, the other thing too is if you're not probably sure about what you want to do too, I'm guessing. If they get that cap lifted, there'll probably be a lot of leasing opportunities again, right? Yes. Because that's what those companies did, right? They bought the yeah. car and then they got that money back and then they could give you a cheap monthly lease because it dropped the overall price of the car down so low. And so, absolutely. you know, if you're wanting to just kind of try try something on for size for a few years, that's a great I'm point. sure there'll be some opportunity there too that'll be lower cost. Yeah, I think Hyundai has their Kona model, which has a lease program now, and because they're one of the ones that haven't hit they that two hundred k, right? So, you know, we talked about range, we talked about cost. I feel like there's probably some other sort of EV benefits we should hit upon. Some would rightly point out that there's a reduced cost of ownership when you're fueling your car with electricity. Uh, you know, on average, you're saving about sixty percent compared to you know the price of gasoline obviously depends on where you live but sure similarly because an ev doesn't have all those moving parts of an engine and and transmission you're also paying less to maintain and consumer reports did a analysis and showed that it's roughly about half the cost to maintain wow. when compared to a an internal combustion engine so that you know we're like 200,000 miles equates to about $4600 that makes sense well, it's like a lot of cars, you know, require synthetic oil and yep, and stuff's expensive. You've got oil changes. Yeah. You don't have any fluid changes on a on an EV. Yeah. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, and you already hit on it. You're, no more stops at gas stations. And in my mind, it's it's perfect to be able to fuel your car at home because you can always plug it in overnight. They're so easy to just get around in in town stuff too. I mean, I know... I'm sure a lot of people will say the same about about their gas cars, but the, it, they are just so simple and and qu- and quiet too. I notice that a lot. They're just you, you you know you don't have any of that engine noise. It's just a nice quiet quiet drive. There there's yeah there's a lot of positives. Yeah, it's nice. You can actually you know use the phone in your car to yeah. call somebody and they can actually hear you on the other end. Yeah, definitely. So I, I guess big picture is there's a lot of good reasons you know, to buy an EV, 
EVs have huge potential to help us reach our carbon reduction goals. And so, you know, kind of begs the question, well, then, you know, what can I do? And, you know, when you have that opportunity to, you know, look at your next vehicle, make sure that you, you look at EVs. Uh, if you're interested in kind of what's out there, I mean, you can do your homework. We also, on our website, uh, we'll have a listing of current long range models so folks can get a sense of generally what's available. It's actually surprising how many models are on the market now. And that's going to change rapidly. If you're not quite to a point where you're ready to take the leap and, and buy an EV, you know, I think what you talked about earlier, like the lease is a perfect option for people. Yeah, and, definitely. And inexpensive as well. Yeah. If you are a, a two-car family, there are now, because EVs have been around, there's actually a decent used market. So you're, you know, for six, $7,000, you can pick up a Nissan Leaf that you'd be able to do most of your, your day-to-day driving. Yeah, I have some friends with a Nissan Leaf. They love that thing. Nice. Yeah, they love it. My parents had one too. That was their first. first oh yeah, Olympic. nice. And then uh, there's also, you know, the opportunity if you, you're you not convinced on an EV and you still want the flexibility of gasoline to look at a plug-in hybrid. So the benefit there is the battery enables you to power, you know, most of your around town driving. And then you have that gasoline engine um, to go on longer, longer trips. Yeah, for sure. So thanks for tuning in. Join us next week as we continue to explore electric vehicles. In the meantime, check us out at climateoptimist.co. That's climateoptimist.co for more resources on EVs and notes from our show. You can also find us on social.